we are exactly right. We'll start with that Spurs Chelsea game, then, of course, Monday Night Football Derby, and it absolutely did not disappoint. The two words I'd go for would be box office. And John, you, of course, were there. Where do we begin with that game? As a fan, what was it like going into the stadium pre match? What were your expectations? Were you hoping to win? And actually, obviously, did that transpire in the way that you expected it to? Yeah, uh, Lewis, yeah. Let's, sorry, let's just, sorry, um, let's just stop. Okay. Sorry. Just get it, keep going again. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Insider Track with me, Lewis Piers, the host of the show. I'm joined by Football Insider editor Wayne Veazey and Tottenham blogger John Wenham. Guys, how are you both doing? Exhausted, Lewis, after last night. Yeah, and Lewis, thanks for having me on. Yeah, just picking up the pieces, really. What, what a game. We really went through all the emotions last night. And uh, how is that going to look for Tottenham long term? That There's some real knock-on impact. So looking forward to getting into it this morning. Fantastic stuff. Well, let's definitely start with Spurs versus Chelsea. That Monday night derby did not disappoint at all. Arguably one of the best games the Premier League has ever seen. John, as a Spurs fan, the morning afterward, where do you stand? What are your thoughts? Going to the match, How? what are the feelings this morning afterwards? Yeah, it's a feeling of a real missed opportunity. Obviously, with a win last night, we could have gone 17 points above Chelsea. That would have effectively... I, I couldn't see them catching us with that sort of you know gap in front. But But now... You know, Chelsea will be resurgent. Chelsea will have confidence. Nicholas Jackson obviously has got a hat-trick. Um, so for Chelsea, I mean, it's going to be a real positive feeling moving forward, despite the fact they really did struggle to break down our 10 or even nine men uh, and the high line. They, they couldn't pick a pass. They couldn't get past us for such a long time until they finally did. When they did, those late two goals were a real sucker punch because at 2-1, even, you know, 90 minutes on the clock, we were still going for it. We came incredibly close with the likes of Rodrigo Bentancourt and also Sun went on a magnificent run. And his legs had unfortunately just given way at the vital moment. But for, for Tottenham, it's the bigger impact. It's all well and good looking at fixtures and saying, how many points will you get from your next six games? Well, we just can't do that anymore because we saw last night it's a bigger knock-on impact. We've now lost Mickey van der Ven for potentially a long time. He was seen coming through the mixed zone at the end of the match, you know, limping and having to be assisted by members of staff. So that's hugely worrying for Tottenham. He's somebody that has slotted in seamlessly, delivered top-level performances and was looking like one of the signings of the summer. We've obviously had James Madison go off injured as well. I'm hoping that that's more precautionary at this stage and we didn't want to, you know, risk inflaming any potential injury because to lose, you know, Madison, who's been the, the leader and the catalyst of this revitalised young, hungry Tottenham team would be a, a, another phenomenal blow. We've then got Romero, who will now be suspended for three games. Again, incredibly frustrating because there was a lot of talk, you know, in the, in the beginning of the season that with the vice-captaincy, with winning the World Cup with Argentina, uh, last year with becoming a new father for the first time he kind of grown up and matured away from 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 his time at foot on you know on the football pitch but actually he's cost us again last night in a big big way and that and that's really worrying because you know he's been a real incredible player for us you know in the, in the early parts of this season he's been a real leader at the back and to lose him along with van der ven suddenly this Tottenham side that were playing one game a week and we're just gradually picking up the three points and and going about their business kind of under the radar the spotlight will now be on us and we're going to, you know, revitalise Wolves on the weekend. He'll be really, really up for that and we'll want to stick it on Tottenham and we'll want to take advantage of the likes of Eric Dyer coming into the side and, and possibly Emerson Royale at centre-half. So, yeah, difficult time coming for Tottenham now. Um, and it's about how they regroup. It's about how they respond to adversity. We haven't had that yet. There was lots of talk that there'd be bumps along the way. Well, we had all those bumps last night in one game of football. I mean, you know, everything that could have gone wrong for Tottenham really did. Um, but we started the game so, so well. You know, the first 15 minutes was how I expected the game to continue. Uh, you know, us leading the game. We could have been 2-0 up, but for a VAR call. Um, so, yeah, the disappointing result and, and I think disappointing longer-term impact on, on what we saw on the game last night. And I just hope it doesn't knock our confidence and, and, and this young team confidence because we're going to be missing you, Doji, as well. You know, not really talked about, but Basuma is one yellow card away from a suspension as well. Um, so for Tottenham, you know, the issues are mounting up. And that comes with AFCON on the, on the, on the horizon where we'll lose Papasar, we'll lose Yves Basuma, Asian Cup will lose Sun as well. Um, there are big issues coming to Tottenham and they need to be smart in their planning and recruitment ahead of the January transfer window so we can get some bodies through the door, you know, for 1st of January, not towards the end of the window. We need players in and we need them fast. So, yeah, for Tottenham, it was a real wake-up call last night and, and maybe, look, if we needed a bump along the road, that certainly was it last night. Yeah, absolutely. Wayne, question for you. So obviously we had our video on Friday. We did some predictions. Now, Paul Robinson was absolutely spot on saying that uh, Romero would get a red card. That that was absolutely nailed on. He did say that and it was coming. There you go. One game later. Um, 
What did you make of the two red cards for Udogi and Romero? Obviously, then the penalty conceded with Romero as well. Did you think they were both reds? Because that was also quite controversial across social media. Yeah, I mean, 100% they're both reds. I think they were both unarguable. I think Udogi should have gone for the first red, uh, for the first um, wild challenge, two-footed challenge. It's only because Sterling sort of pulled his body away, saw it coming, that, um, you know, didn't do some serious damage. Um, quite why he only got a yellow card for that is... It's completely unclear, and I mean the second one was sort of a three-quarter one as well, wasn't it? I mean that was abs- that was nearly a straight red in itself. Um, so yeah, he almost deserved two reds. Udigi, I think Ramirez was a definite red, um, and it was a definite penalty as well. So you know he clearly followed through. And um, just picking up John's point, I mean I think he is a liability for this Tottenham team. This team is this Tottenham team is brilliant to watch, by the way. I think um, huge amounts of credit needs to go to the cover for the way he played, not only in the start of the game, but also with 10 men and then with nine men. Um, I don't think Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola could have been braver. I don't think any coach in world football would have been braver than he was last night. Because this wasn't a weak Chelsea team. Yes, it's a sort of developing Chelsea team, but it wasn't a weak one. And he was extraordinarily brave. And, um, you know, he, he will make Tottenham a very popular team, I think, for neutrals. If you play like that with nine men, you're going to make a lot of friends along the way, and it, you know it was a it was a wild game. It was a mind-boggling game, um, but it was brilliant to watch. And Tottenham made it brilliant to watch, even with ten and nine men. Um, but big, big question marks over Romero, and not just for three games, John. Either is it? I mean, you're looking at the the coach team. You're looking at this. Can we rely on this guy long term? Now, if Tottenham want to be a Top four title challenging team. Can we rely on this guy? You know, you're probably not going to have Mickey de van der Ven for three months. Maybe I think if it's, if it's grade three hamstring tear. Um, I mean, you mentioned in the mid zone, they were kind of still assisting him. He, it could be a very, very serious injury there, couldn't it? And um, no one wants, well, no Tottenham fan wants Eric Dyer at middle of defence for three months. So they're in that system as well. Yeah, yeah I think it's, oh, go on, John, you say. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, to, to lose Mickey van der Ven in terms of our whole build-up play and structure and the way we play it onto his left foot and he instantly plays the ball out, you know, onto the left-hand side, is it, it, a huge, huge blow for us. Because last night's injuries also lost us Brennan Johnson. He came off um, to, to make tactical changes. But Brennan Johnson had started the game very, very well. And that link-up play, I was excited to see between him and van der Ven and a partnership building there. Um, so, 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 yeah, it was a real blow to lose Mickey. And uh, his impact and his instant success, really, in this team has not been unnoticed. So... Yeah, Tottenham have got, have got some real decisions to make on, on the training pitch between now and, and Saturday at Molyneux. Um, but yeah, the games are hard. You know, Molyneux, uh, and then we've got Villa at home, a game we took no points from last year, and then Man City away. So to be missing Romero, definitely, and, and, and most likely Van der Ven for both of those games is, is a huge, huge ask and will really impact this, this hugely positive start to the season Tottenham have. One player I just want to give huge credit for last night as well was uh, Vicario. This is a guy that has slotted in seamlessly. You know, he was, he was heralded as the cheap option when we got him over over David Rea. It looks an absolute Fabio Paratici masterstroke now um, to, you know, play the Italian market, know exactly who to get and use his agents and, and resources in that field. Um, he was superb in the sweeper-keeper role last night, something that we hadn't seen, you know, took me back to sort of Manuel Neuer sort of levels at Bayern many years ago. Um, really, really good performance, strong performance from Vicario, and he's going from strength to strength. So huge credit to Tottenham's recruitment team for, for that signing. Yeah, and if we look at a positive spin on the game, you know, Ange post-match said that, you know, sort of Spurs are now really creating that DNA. And he said that even even with five men, they'd have had a crack. They'd have given it a go, which I thought was really brave of him, like you were saying, Wayne. Do you think, Wayne, that Spurs are now showing a different mentality yesterday than they've had in previous seasons? Because I can't remember the last time I watched a Spurs team that not only went for it so much, but actually showed that desire and hunger, even with only nine players on the field. Well, the last time they had a sort of setup like that was when the guy who's in the other dugout last night was was managing Tottenham because they obviously didn't have it under Marino Conte or um, or Nuno, did they? Because they they were all pretty negative, counter attacking setups, and you know, most Tottenham fans left bored to tears. Whereas last night they were amazing. It wasn't just last night. He set up the team every single match this season to play on the front foot and they haven't played like that since Pochettino's manager so I think you're right when you talk about a DNA I mean 
Postal Cogba is a really, really interesting coach, isn't he? Because I mean, he's in his mid-50s and it's almost like he's come out of nowhere because obviously he was did really, really well at Celtic for two years and they were they were fantastic to watch at Celtic. So and loads of Premier League clubs looked at him. Um I think his his agents were working very hard last season to get him a move to a Premier League club because that's that was the next step in his career. But you know, lots of clubs also chose not to take him and you know, Tottenham have got so many managers wrong, John, haven't they, over the over the league being Lewis era? I mean, the list is a very, very long one of, of, of mistakes and those kind of strong manager appointments you could kind of um, rattle up on one hand and Pochettino would probably be number one on, not on those. But I think Postacoglu could be every bit as good for Tottenham as... Pochettino was. Um, that, I mean, I, I, I'm being very, very impressed with him. Yeah, and no, I mean, you, you talked about the terrible managerial appointments. The post, uh, Pochettino, sorry, was the only manager in Levy and Enix tenure to ever get a renewed contract. I mean, that speaks yeah. volumes. Every other one has been sacked or they've just been allowed their contract to run out and leave the club. So, yeah, if, if Postacoglu can build something of a legacy like Poch did and, and gave Tottenham's fans so many great memories, I was really pleased actually last night. I know there had been some talk of booing of Pochettino and things like that. That just didn't happen in the stadium. Um, and I'm pleased for that. You know, this is something that delivered us great times and took us 90 minutes from winning the biggest club trophy you can win. So I was pleased for, for, for Poch as well to get a good reception. Um, but yeah, movement, and I, I just think it's been a breath of fresh air in the club. You know, and, and it spirals through. You know, the, the academy teams are absolutely flying this year. The women's team are doing well as well. There's a real good feeling at Hotspur way. And I think a lot of that comes down to Ange and, and, and the way he is and his kind of mannerisms. So... I think Tottenham have struck gold with this appointment. And uh, yeah, hopefully it can continue for many, many years to come. Is it, John, is it, is it a lucky, is it just, is it just like, oh, you know, he was on a list and they've gone through their list and they just happened to negotiate and agree a deal with him? Or is there an element of actual planning here? Because, you know, Tottenham made so many wrong turns, haven't they, with managers? And obviously in the new, in the summer where they got new, no. Everyone turned them down before they end up getting new. And I think I think Arnie Slot turned them down in the earlier this year, in the summer. I mean, is it just a bit of luck? Do you think, or is there actually is this a bit of sort of Levy Paratici planning? Well, actually, I think it comes from Scott Munn. Scott Munn has the Australian link there, a, a new um, new Ange from his time at kind of the City Group when Ange had, had the club in, in Australia. Um, and obviously, Man City played a friendly against the Japanese team that Ange had many years back in, in a summer. And Pep made real comments about, you know, he had never seen a side play like this and stick it on his Manchester City side in that level. So Ange has got a good feeling amongst the City group. And, and I think yeah. Scott Munn, obviously, came from, came from there. So I, I would say it's more from Scott Munn. And for somebody that was instantly kind of put down by Tottenham fans when he was appointed as who is this guy and what does he know about English football? That might be Scott Munn's greatest work, and I don't think he's getting too much credit for it as yet. So, yeah, I would certainly say it's to do with him rather than, than Levy or Paratici on this one. Yeah, all Aussies across the world are smiling looking at Andrew's successes so far this season. Absolutely. If we switch focus and look at the West London team, of course, in Chelsea, you know, last night, Nicholas Jackson, hat-trick, albeit you could maybe argue was was kind of a bit unfair towards the end of the game, but even still did score a hat-trick. Do you think potentially they, they might have struck gold in him as a player, Wayne? Do you think actually he might start to take off? No, 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 I don't, I don't see him as an elite Premier League striker. I think last night, um, you know, they were counter-attack finishes and I think you know they were they were not super difficult finishes I think he, he even hesitated on the yeah. final one where he's, and I think um Vicario kind of went down maybe a little bit too and Vicario had a brilliant game by the way and I totally endorse what John was saying about sweep keeper which was you know it was Edison times 10 wasn't it it was so good um but I no I don't think Jackson's an elite striker I think he's I think he's very raw I think his movement's good and I think he's got um, you know, he's got good pace, but I think, you know, he does lack composure. Um, Raheem Sterling helped him a lot last night. I thought Sterling was good actually last night and sort of sort of led the way for Chelsea. Um, and um, Kasada I thought was good in the middle of the pitch. But yeah, I mean, Jackson, I think if Poch turns him into the next Harry Kane, then, you know, he deserves every single penny of that salary that Chelsea are paying him. Yeah. John, yeah, what did you mean? Oh, go on, go on, John, you say. Sorry, I just totally agree with Wayne's points there. I mean, Jackson actually was coming up before those goals towards the end, a comedy of misses um, and wasted chances that were being laid on a plate for him. 
Um, it was, the finishes he did score were sort of training ground finishes, you know, one on one with a keeper with lots of time. Um, I, I really wasn't overly impressed with him as I haven't been this season. There's been huge misses, you know, in vital games at home to Forest and and, and Bournemouth, I believe. Um, yeah, for me, he's another sort of cursed Chelsea striker um, to go with the long list of the Kesmans and Yamutus and and Crespos and, and those types. As soon as they put on the blue of Chelsea, have a you know, I don't know if it's the the, the fear of living up to the image of, of Didier Drogba and what he did for the club, but the forwards Chelsea have got now are a million miles away from anything of that level and that ability to pump the ball long and dominate defenders. They just don't have it. Um, uh, you know, I actually thought on the whole, I know, you know, we're history will remember a 4-1 Chelsea win at Tottenham, but I wasn't that impressed with them as I haven't been all season. And uh, I, I still expect Tottenham to finish, with, you know, at least 17 to 20 points above Chelsea this season. Wow, that is a, that's a strong and brave prediction. We'll have to make sure we know that one down too. If we look at the overall pitch then, so, you know, taking both all points uh, into consideration, you know, do games like yesterday prove why the Premier League is argued as the best league in the world, John? Do you think, you know, actually a, a blockbuster, despite maybe the scoreline not necessarily reflecting actually the game as a whole, in terms of the drama and that feeling of literally non-stop action, as a neutral watching it, it literally felt end-to-end -end the entire game. It felt a bit, felt, felt a bit like a game of like basketball, it literally didn't stop, even at nine men. I know you mentioned that Spurs, um, the Son chance earlier, right at the end for Spurs, when he literally just dragged it. I mean, he just sort of fell over, dragged it a bit wide. Keeper makes a good save. Um, do you think actually that the game yesterday does prove that the Premier League is la creme de la creme? It's funny. I, I sort of feel like, and I'm sure every fan of every club feels like this, I feel like every Tottenham game is involved in all this mass drama and VAR calls and end-to-end -end decisions. Uh, I can't think of a single Tottenham game I go to, it's just boring and we just kind of get the job done and win 1-0. You know, you can think of the Luton game, but we still played with 10 men the entire game, with Basuma being sent off. So, you know, I just feel like our games and the style of football we play encourages that. But the, the Premier League as a whole is just so exciting, isn't it? You can sit down and watch any game and there is mass drama, there's incident, there's passionate fans. And I think a lot of that does come from the support in England. You know, every ground is full up, every ground is, is every club's bang up for it. And on your day, anybody can beat anybody. And that, that is what makes the league so, so magical. We've seen that with the all-flying Manchester City already losing a couple of times this season. You know, and, uh, to, to one of the games Spurs have got to go to this week at Molyneux. You know, you get down to Wolves and they're up for it. They've got Neto running at you and others. So every club has got their own talisman. Every club's got their their own identity. And uh, yeah, there's just no no givens in this league. So that that is why, for me, it's comfortably the best league in the world. And, and I think what was what was kind of really interesting about last night was... Last night was you know, a remarkable game. But that kind of made Liverpool-Tottenham, which also was, you know, probably before t last night, was probably the most controversial match of the season, even kind of outshading Arsenal-Newcastle the weekend. But was last night was just a different level, wasn't it? I don't think I can ever remember. I mean, the Battle of the Bridge was pretty lively, John, wasn't it, in, in 2016? But, and yeah. then, you know, the Man United-Arsenal games, probably turn in the millennium, but that was different level last night because the football was so intense all the way through as well as all the talking points all the way through um but I mean Tottenham to me looked like a, a top four side I mean I think Van der Ven's a huge loss and I think that there'll be a lot of pressure um in terms of the his replacement and also a lot of focus towards the January window because Eric dies out of contract at the end of the season um, he's, he had not played a single minute, I think, before before last night. He's not going to sign a new contract from from what I've been told. And you know, he wants to be a free agent next summer so he can have his choice of options. So, so suddenly, Postacoglu has got to go, kind of get a tune out of him, get him playing a very, very different way because I think he very much suited the kind of negative, sit-back, slow build-up styles of... Conte and Mourinho but playing a high line under Ange and he's not the quickest Die, he never was the quickest yeah. and that he's got any quicker um I think he's really really struggled with that high line John I don't know I don't know I mean Tottenham it, fans it, are probably it, it's interesting I, I actually don't think it's a guarantee obviously whilst Romero's injured he would slot into the right hand side but yeah. actually I think if Ben Davis can come back to fitness I think he will slot in as the left centre-back in place of Van der Ven because he plays left centre-back for Wales, obviously naturally left-footed. Um, and during pre-season, we saw him get a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, in, in that role. So I think Ben Davis would, would come in, but obviously Romero's red card just, just limits us for options-wise. So I expect two of the academy boys in Ashley Phillips, who joined from Blackburn this summer, and Alfred Dorrington to maybe be pulled out of tonight's game at Cambridge for the under-21s and step up into the squad and be an option for, for Wolves on Saturday. 
But, you know, you, you said a top four finish, uh, that Wayne. You know, I certainly think as a minimum before the season started, we finished just from the pre-season games I saw and the way we were going to attack people this year, despite losing our greatest ever player, in my opinion, in Harry Kane, I still thought we'd finish kind of minimum of fifth this year. And what I've seen so far this season tells me that, you know, we can finish higher than that. Um, it, it really does. You know, despite the loss of Van der Ven last night, I think that Angie's style will get the better out of players and we will see an Eric Dyer perform at a better level than he has done for the last two or three years in any event. Um, I, I just think that, you know, under his management, under his, you know, style and, and the belief he has in players, I think we'll get more out of everybody. Um, so I still think we will do OK in this period, even if we are losing, you know, our two best centre-backs for, for a significant period of time. Yeah, and as we as uh, exclusively reported last week by Football Insider, and as we discussed Wayne on Friday, it looks like there's going to be a quite there was a quite a big behind the scenes overhaul at Tottenham. It looks like in terms of recruitment, that might change quite a lot going forward in terms of at least the January transfer window, if not the summer for definite. Are there any names that Tottenham are looking at in terms of centre back going into the window? And do you how important do you think the transfer window is going to be for Spurs, given all these injuries and, and all the rest of it that we discussed about? I think. It will change things without a doubt. Um, I don't think there are any specific names that um, done deals or anything like that with regard to January. I mean, they were, it's interesting that they're looking more at a defender. They were anyway looking more at defender than a striker, even though they lost Harry Kane. And you know, he's you know obviously as John said, a great set of player, no doubt about that. But they went specifically looking at a striker to replace him. I, mean, I think they've decided that he, they can't replace him. And I think Andrew's been quite open about that, hasn't he? Because he said. Um, you know, Son's very much suits the central role in his setup. Um, so I think, you know, potentially Richardson's position is an issue. I mean, Johnson looks a sort of like for life for him anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, defender, I think, was on the radar anyway. And and I think a centre, central midfielder, if um, Hoiberg goes as well, I mean, Hoiberg um, is still kind of a, a key squad man, but he came close to leaving in the summer. And I think his future is very much up in the air. And um, our sort of transfer guru, Pete O'Rourke, he reported yesterday that um, centre mid and defence are the two positions Tottenham are concentrating on. And I don't think last night changes anything with regards to that at all. Um, and there will be a lot of pressure, I think, from Tottenham fans, especially if re results start to go a bit downhill, which is kind of inevitable anyway, given how brilliant they've started. Um, and, you know, the injuries kicking in, I think there'll be a bit of pressure from Tottenham fans. Come on, get us a better, better sense back. Dyer's leaving. We've got to get someone in to replace him. Yeah. John, what are your hopes for the window then? Yeah, I, ju I just imagine that we'll revisit some of the players we targeted in the summer window who now have less time on their contracts. So the likes of uh, Lloyd Kelly, I know he's been linked with other clubs now. But, you know, we were in for Lloyd Kelly. He, he's, I think he's got CAA bases as his reps. Tottenham have a very, very good relationship with them. Um, he can cover left back and centre back, counts as homegrown, young potential upsell value. He ticked a lot of boxes in terms of Tottenham's recruitment style. Um, so I could see them revisiting Lloyd Kelly. Obviously, Toysin Adeboyo at uh, Fulham as well is one they heavily looked at before. Another homegrown option, but a right sided centre back. Again, six months left on his contract. Um, and look, in the summer, they were before they signed Mickey van der Ven, they were really pushing for Edwin Tapsoba. But I understand he's since signed a new long term deal at uh, Bayer Leverkusen since that deal didn't happen. So, um, and he'd be an expensive one. So, so I, I imagine Lloyd Kelly could really be an option for Tottenham. I know there'll be other clubs in for him, but I just think when Tottenham are in for a player that base have got, Tottenham do tend to get the upper hand. Um, so, so I could see Lloyd Kelly being a sensible option for Tottenham. And if, you know, who are we to question? People might say, Lloyd Kelly, what's he ever done? The signings that have been made by Tottenham over the last kind of 24 months have, have been better than anything we've done for two decades. And they really have, you know. So we're talking about Tottenham making recruitment changes. To me, these recruitment changes are a little bit hollow, I've got to be honest with you. Every game I've been to this season, Fabio Paratici has been in attendance. Fabio Paratici is still running the rings at Tottenham. Whatever we're told about him stepping back, I just don't see that. You know, he sat in the director's box again last night. Um, away games, he sometimes sat in the away end as he was with me at Brentford. Um, so, you know, any thought that he's not involved, I just don't see. I think he's really earned Levy's trust. The signings now are just completely delivering time and time again. So I think he will still be heavily involved with Tottenham on a consultancy basis. Um, and anyone else coming in, yes, they can have their own ideas and maybe they'll specialise in other areas or territories in terms of Tottenham targeting specific players. But I think Fabio Paratici will still have a big hand in Tottenham recruitment. Another player that he was mad for, and it was reported that he was obsessed with, 
uh, was Anthony Gordon, who's now delivering some, some really good stuff up at Newcastle. And he was one at the time. People said, oh, why, why the hell are Tottenham after him? Well, again, you know, Fabio Paratici was, was, was bang on the money with that. And he would have been a good signing for us. So, yeah, I, I think we will have a, another Fabio Paratici influence window, despite what we are told about bands or, or anything like that. And don't you think that is, um, you know, gaming the system, though, and that is fundamentally wrong because the whole point of a ban is to be banned, isn't it? And if he's still um, running the show and I completely endorse that, you are obviously right because he's he's at all the matches, he's in the yeah. director's box and, you know, it doesn't doesn't need um, Miss Marple and Echo Pro to kind of work out the fingerprints behind a lot of those signings all coming from Italy in and sort of players who've played in Italian leagues. So it's pretty obvious who's behind them. Um, but that's just wrong, isn't it? I mean, even even a Tottenham fan must, must or, or do you not care? Or do you you're just kind of uh, happy to... Uh, I'll, I'll, be brutally, I'll be brutally honest with you, I don't care. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, honestly, uh, that, that, that summer 29 we, 119 window that absolutely killed us and continues to kill us on salary and wages of Ovendon Bele and the Celso and Clark and Cessignon, to have moved on from that, and to now to be delivering the likes of Vicarios and Van der Bend and the Sumers and Sars, you know, picking out these players. It's absolute chalk and cheese. And I would suggest actually our recruitment level now is only behind Brighton as the rest of the Premier League. If you look at what we've actually got in terms of new signings coming in and the value for money we're seeing on them compared to... I, I'd put league. Man City number one, actually. But yeah, yeah no, I in, think... In, in Man City, in terms of identifying targets and getting them straight away and, and then yeah. being a successor, Doku, Haaland, Gavardiol you know, Rodri, yeah. yeah, okay. But in terms of the, the money then maybe spent, you know. Yeah, I mean, so Tottenham remind me a bit, John, of, of Liverpool um, during the Michael Edwards era, where yeah. they kind of, because, because Man City are kind of going for the obvious, I mean, Doku was probably slightly different, but Gavardio, everyone knew Gavardio was a brilliant yeah. left-sided centre-back and would immediately hit the ground running. I mean, you, didn't, you don't need to be a director of football or head of recruitment or chief scout to work that one out. Whereas, you know, Tottenham are very much doing what Liverpool are doing under... Edwards was spotting players slightly under the radar who might have, who might not um, be, who are, his value is relatively low, sort of 15 million. What was, what was Vicaro? 18 million, was he? And then um, um, Udegi, was, he was less than that. He was 20 yeah, million, was he? Million. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's very much like Liverpool, where when they were getting Mane for, for 30, they were getting um, Salah, Win 35 them. million. Yeah. Um, you know, brilliant, you know, Fabino, sort of brilliant signings in that bracket below what Man United and Man City and Real Madrid were paying. Um, and they were immediately making making a huge yeah. impact. And these Tottenham guys, they're, they're coming into the team and doing well straight away. And that always shows you a brilliant sign. It's none of this, oh, we need six months to get used to the pace of the game, all that rubbish. It's actually, well, no, they're, they're, they've been identified to fill a role in this team and they are good enough under the right coach and doing the right work yeah. on the training ground every week to actually make an impact on the team straight away. That's what proper recruitment is. And I think Brock Brighton's is obviously different because they're kind of developing them in a slower way and even younger age, aren't they, generally? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Tottenham have improved immensely. And I think you'll really see, under this manager, you'll really see the impact of that, not only this season, but next season. Very much like like Liverpool. Um, and I think, by the way, Liverpool have improved their recruitment a lot this summer um, after the disaster of a couple of years. But yeah, I mean, Tottenham are yeah a massive difference, no doubt about that. If we move up to the northwest, actually, this all feeds in quite nicely because we can talk about Liverpool and Wayne, as exclusively reported by Football Insider. Sounds like Liverpool could actually be planning to reinforce their squad going into the January transfer window. And there is actually one name we've already mentioned who uh, looks like could be heading up to the northwest. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be um, quite a tussle for for Lloyd Kelly of Bournemouth because. Um, he is out of contract then the season. They've not been able to tie him down to a, to a new deal. I think they've offered him contracts and he's biding his time, waiting to see what options are on the table. And there's going to be a few, I think, Tottenham were linked with a 20 million deadline day bid and Bournemouth not that back um, because I think they didn't have time to bring in a replacement. And they were a bit sort of frustrated with Tottenham that they came in so late for Kelly because they didn't have enough time to to find someone to succeed him. But, you know, Tottenham will likely revisit that. I mean, the one thing is he is a left-sided centre-back who plays left-back. So someone who 
play two different roles. Liverpool don't have got an injured left back at the moment, and Joe Gomez played left back on Sunday, not particularly well. Um, he's obviously a centre back who can fill in at right back. So Liverpool don't even trust Simicas um, in a Premier League match away to Luton, which is, tells you quite a lot. Um, and Liverpool did look at versatile centre-back in the summer. They very, very much all the way through, they were looking at some centre-back who could play full-back. And I think with the way Liverpool's systems changed, with Arnold's role change, the way that's changed, and he's playing in midfield a lot. And Sunday played almost the whole the second half in midfield. Um, Liverpool will be in for that type of player, that sort of very versatile defender again in, in January. And, and Kelly ticks a lot of boxes, doesn't he? He's 25, he's mobile he's tall um he's got a lot of premier league experience um and he's and he's and he's homegrown so um i think he's you know he's one they'll definitely look at as well and john given how much bournemouth really have struggled i'd say this season in the league do you think the club would be best to maybe take a fee for kelly in january and then try and get someone else in to keep them up or actually are they best just to hold out till the summer hope that kelly can keep them up and then really reassess going on for next season yeah, I think if I was in, in Bournemouth's shoes, I'd be wanting to keep my best players. You know, you've got somebody there that I think is deputised as a captain a few times as well. So he's got leadership skills. Um, and I think you need to keep around the core of, of homegrown players, you know, in, in any squad in the Premier League. So if I was Bournemouth, I'd be doing everything to keep him. You know, staying in the league is obviously worth significantly more than the 15 million or so, say, they'll get for Lloyd Kelly in January. Um, so, yeah, from my point of view, they've, they've got to be doing everything they can keep to do to keep him and also supplement that and go out and get better players to play with Lloyd Kelly to give themselves the best possible chance of staying in the league. Bournemouth have got some good players in that squad. You know, I think they're in a bit of a false position at the moment. I think Philip Billing's a very good player um, and they've got some, some really pacey wingers and Dominic Solanke gives them a presence up front. So I think Bournemouth should be doing better than they are. And talking of strikers, I think, Wayne, we've got to go back to Friday. Your prediction, you went for Luton nil, Liverpool 6, which wasn't exactly on the money. But one thing that certainly was, was Darwin Nunez's hat-trick of misses. Of course, was hyped up on Friday by Jurgen Klopp. Didn't turn out exactly the way that Liverpool fans had hoped. Wayne, do you think there is a superstar in the making there? Or is he never going to fulfil his potential? What did you make of his overall performance in the match? I thought his, his overall performance was sort of Darwin Nunez crystallised into 90 minutes because... No, 95% of what he does is brilliant. Um, his movement's exceptional, his pace is exceptional, gets in goal-scoring positions, you know, sort of Michael Owen level, sort of goal-scoring positions. And if he had Michael Ev Owen's level of cool-headedness and calm finishing, he'd probably already have 18 Premier League goals this season and he'd go and score 55 because he gets so many chances. Um, really good analysis, I thought, from Daniel Sturridge last night on actually where he specifically needs to improve his finishing and it's kind of you know it's when um it's not just the simple chances but it's kind of when you don't need to over hit them because at the moment he's just whacking everything and that sort of style of finishing worked very well for alan shearer but he was obviously supremely honed um i think nunes is a potential superstar but i would not put my mortgage on it happening um you know Harlem will definitely score. and If he doesn't get injured, Harlem will score 40, 45 Premier League goals this season. Nunes could end up with eight or he could end up with 28. It's just almost impossible to know. I don't think Liverpool coaching staff know. Um, Klopp spoke very, very positively about him on Friday, as he often does, to be honest, about, about a lot of the players. And, and probably it did raise a few eyebrows with what he said. You know, he was scared about levels of his potential. Um, but these misses are sort of so regular and borderline embarrassing for a prayer. I mean, non-league strikes would have been embarrassed by the Luton miss. Non-league strikes would have been embarrassed by the um, Europa League miss, open goal one. Um, will he continue to keep missing them? He's not super young. He's not 19, is he? I mean, he's 25, I think. Um, his finishing should be far more polished for an 85 million striker. But massive asset and he terrorises defences. Yeah, there's no doubt about that for sure. John, do you think Liverpool may be overpaid for Darwin? I mean, you know, taking into account the current inflation of the market, Man United fans often jibe at Liverpool and might say that they overpaid for, for him. Do you think he actually might meet his valuation at some point in years to come? Or actually, is there is there an argument to make that actually Liverpool did overpay? 
No, I actually think he's brilliant. Whenever I watch Liverpool, I come off watching it, but he's a complete menace. I, I actually really enjoy the, the chaotic style of him. He really gets into opponents. He lets them know he's there. Some of his, you know, we talked about the big misses, but you've got to be in those positions, you know, to have those misses. But he also scores some absolutely wonderful goals. I love the goal at Bournemouth in the Cup in the week. Um, I saw a, a tweet that suggested that Darwin Nunes is the most Tottenham player that doesn't play for Tottenham. I don't know if you take that defensively. <laughs> Or, or not, but um, for, for me, no, I, I really like him. He's got that kind of South American flair to him that, that I really like in players, and he's aggressive as well. And uh, I think when it does click for him, Liverpool will be really lucky, and they'll have a real, uh, real dangerous player on their hands who can play equally as well through the middle or on the wings. And uh, yeah, I, I just find him an exciting player to watch. So you know, to drive the Man United fans, to drive that Liverpool have overpaid for, for, for anybody is it, just laughable when they're constantly freezing players out paying over value for, for players so that Real Madrid can, can have complete overhauls and rebuilds. Um, Man United, you know, waste the most money in the Premier League without any doubt. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about the the, the league table of recruitment, I think Man United would be, without doubt, the bottom club. Um, yeah. The, the, you know, the, the, the amount of, you know, the wages they pay for really average players and the transfer fees are absolutely extraordinary. There's no structure, there's no coherence, there's no plan. Um, even, even, Chelsea, who's probably recruitment over the last 80 months has been the worst in football history, at least in the summer, they had an actual plan of, you know, we won't sign players over 25. And they didn't sign Madison because he was over 25. And, you know, he's someone they were they, they were very keen on and liked. And, you know, Madison's obviously done amazingly for Tottenham, but they didn't sign him because of his age. And that is a plan. Um, whereas... With Man United, it's literally who's the biggest name, or who was good once, or who 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 did they think was quite decent, and all the all the scouts Man United from right here they tear their hair out because um, they just they know that what they say doesn't actually make that much difference, and it's just it's done a lot of it's done on a whim and and through you know agent contacts and what happened with Ten Hag and um, the SEG agent agency, I think that was embarrassing a lot is disgraceful in the summer and very very dubious as well um and that's completely the wrong way to run run your whole transfer setup and um and that's why one of the reasons why the team's so bad um whereas you know excellent recruitment you know it's you know with with the right coaching setup can make a very 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 strong team work brilliantly for liverpool and the goalkeeper situation at old trafford is just baffling i mean to to let yeah. Mateo go who's a significantly better goalkeeper in my opinion than Onana, and then to yeah. pay a big fee for Onana uh, on, on top of it is just a complete disaster. Yeah. And, and Onana doesn't even fit the sort of way Ten Hag plays anyway, because Onana's kind of been brought in to, um, you know, be the, be the sweeper keeper and sort of play, ping the balls to the midfielders and out wide to the winger, but Ten Hag doesn't even play like that. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's like Conte and Marino, really, in terms of the... The playing style very negative, very counter attacking, and actually, De Gea in that kind of setup was probably the right kind of keeper. Um, so it's it was re in, really, really in bizarre. just one summer, just on United, one final point in one summer, it really feels like age has caught up with Varane with these constant injuries, with Casimiro with the constant yeah. injuries, and also Ericsson, who the last time I saw him was a complete shadow of the player I remember at Tottenham, uh, and obviously that went off to, to Inter Milan and then won some big trophies there. So I just think age has really caught up with United as well as the bad buys of Anthony and of Mount um, that just aren't performing. Um, so, yeah, big, big problems lie ahead for Man United, not just for now, but for the future as well. And Wayne, it sounds like, as reported exclusively by Football Insider over the weekend, there is actually going to be huge change coming for United in terms of the club's ownership model. Can you kind of fill us in on this and what that might look like in years to come for the side? Yeah, one of the kind of big plans of Sir Jim Ratcliffe um, when he completes the first stage of his takeover which might be another kind of month or so away is to, to implement a multi-club model um very similar to man city's um so jim rack have already owns two clubs um nice and france and Lausanne in switzerland and he wants a multi-club model where man united can sort of develop young players farm out their young talent on loan and then develop them in kind of weaker leagues and for their feeder teams then bring them back to Man United and put them in their first team and Man City have done that um, with a lot of success um, and also made a lot of money from it as well in terms of then selling those players who might not be deemed good enough for the Man City team but selling them 
for big money. Um, and Man United, that is the model that Sir Jim Ratcliffe wants. I was, I, you know, I've been told that he's going to, that's kind of key to him taking over the football operations because at the moment, Man United, unlike all Premier League clubs, they're not able to buy players under the age of 18 because, um, from overseas because of the Brexit law. So that's why kind of, you see Brighton have their own team abroad. That's why Man City have kind of got all these teams. I mean, loads of the Premier League clubs now, they've got almost like a feeder team, haven't they? And that, and because Brexit rules, that makes it even more important. So that's kind of the real story behind why he will take over the football operations and, you know, from, from the Glazers, he'll kind of retain the majority control. And you can actually see it does make sense. And I think from Man United fans' point of view, they might think, well, at least, at least that's a plan. Because there isn't a plan at the moment because it's just completely incoherent, everything. And it's, it's almost mad how badly the club is run. John, have you got any thoughts on on the opinion? Because I think overall, really, multi-club models have, have kind of been argued for and against over, over the last few years, especially with obviously Manchester City and their domination with the City Football Group. Now, I think, no doubt, I think having a stake in another club does open up doors that single club ownership doesn't have. But do you think as years to come, it might become more challenging because there are then less clubs left on the market to sort of join forces with? Yeah, absolutely. I know, I know Tottenham have, have tried this a few times and have never quite got over the line, especially with the Dutch league. I believe there was a very close to an affiliation with, with Roda JC, Dutch club. It got as far as sending Carl Walker Peters over there. He wasn't happy and he came back and everything seemed to be cancelled. Um, but yeah, you know, Tottenham obviously have looked into it before and they haven't done it themselves. Other clubs doing it, yeah, it makes absolute sense. Uh, as, as Wayne touched on earlier, you know, Brighton do it very, very well. A lot of the players that then come into their team in the Premier League, do kind of one year in Belgium first. I know they've got a Ivory Coast winger now, his name escapes me, Andorin or Angorin, that starts a lot of games on the, the other side to Mitoma, who did a year in, in Belgium, yeah. sort of toughening up first of all. Obviously, look, as we said, Brexit, work permit issues, getting players from South America to settle into a European league, it all makes sense and I see why clubs do it. For United, though, I just wonder if they could have done more with local clubs in their area. There's a lot of teams in that area, Stockport, obviously we saw what happened to Tiberi, um, you know, uh, Bolton Wanderers, Wigan, there's plenty of clubs in that area that I think United could have utilised better in terms of the players could have continued to train at Carrington and then played matches with their loan clubs on the weekend and they could have been doing that and should have been doing that. And I don't really know why they haven't utilised that because Manchester City have utilised that option and I know Liverpool over the years have really utilised their local clubs in terms of loaning players there and you can keep an eye on them and they can still live with the same host family and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I, can, I can see it becoming more popular um, and, and obviously, I can see Tottenham maybe approaching that model as well with Scott Munn's uh, appointment at the club and how he worked with the City Group before. He'll have expertise and knowledge on that. And that might have been a reason he's been brought in. Yeah, Wayne. And it, oh, as you mentioned, obviously, Jim Ratcliffe owns OG Nice and Lausanne. Do you think, like we've kind of touched on potentially, will that network expand quickly or is it a slow development to kind of get in touch with other clubs and then form alliances? How does that work? Well, I think it depends how well connected you are and how well connected the people in your management team are as well and you know if there's any doors already open that they can kind of push through to to get a deal done but I mean the, the interesting thing is um you know I'm told from sort of people who work for Man United is that they almost feel like they're doing the job with one hand tied behind their back in terms of recruitment they feel like they've been very much left behind um when it comes to sourcing the elite global talent and, you know, Brighton are absolutely nailing it in South America, aren't they? You, you know, particularly and um, bringing through some amazing players that then obviously selling on for, you know, astonishing fees because they're the best example of that. And United at the moment, they said we can't even compete with Brighton. That's, that's, that's where they are, which is extraordinary, isn't it? It's absolutely extraordinary. And the work permit rules have changed a huge amount and I mean no, no one's gonna no neutral's gonna cry for Man United are they but you know they are definitely struggling in that front and you know that is kind of very very you know key to Jim Ratcliffe's sort of early plans and I think I'd expect um, them to have a couple more clubs definitely within within a year or two. 
And if we start to wrap up this Premier League segment, segment then, Wayne, we're going to talk about Arsenal very briefly. Um, of course, further contra- controversy on Sunday at St. James's Park involving the Newcastle and Arsenal game. Can you kind of walk us through it and what you made of the entire situation with the ball going out of play and not going out of play? Yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously three instances there, isn't there? The ball is out of play or not. Um, I think very much dependent upon camera angles. You know, if you look at a certain image, it looks very much in play. But then if you look at the look at it from a different vantage point, um, actually, it wasn't necessarily in play. Um, I think the push from Jalinton um, wasn't, I don't think that was a foul. I think that was, um, I think that was completely legitimate. And um, I think what the third one was, was the offside. It wasn't completely conclusive. So I, I can see why the goal stood. And also, I think Arsenal's reaction was disgraceful. I thought, um, you know, Georgino wouldn't um, shake the hand of Lascelles. Arteta's comments, um, Arteta's got a lot of previous, isn't he, on kind of completely losing it. Um, And though he said it in a relatively measured way, I thought his comments were wrong and way overblown. And I thought the statement was embarrassing for a club of you know, Arsenal's standing and, you know, they were, they were, they used to be known as a really classy club, you know, when, when Ken Fry was secretary, they would never, have, never in a million years have released a statement like that. And I think they'll come, in the future, they'll look back and they'll be really, they should be really embarrassed. They should be embarrassed today, but I think they'll look back in six months and say, oh, hang on, why do you did that? And, and um, you know, they're not the only ones, by the way, I don't think Liverpool were right to um, put their statement out, you know, very sort of threatening statement um, after the Tottenham game. And I thought Liverpool were much more hard done by. Uh, I thought Liverpool were much hard done by than Arsenal were, by the way. I don't think Arsenal were hard done by at all. Um, I thought Liverpool were genuinely really hard done by, but I still thought their statement was really wrong. Don't like it. I completely agree with um, those observers who are saying, you know, this has to end. I don't think it's good. I mean, VR needs massive improvements. No doubt about that. But putting out threatening statements from clubs, please stop it. It's not good. And John, what's going to happen to resolve this issue? What's next for Arsenal and VAR and and, and these controversies of the game? Just on the controversy of the game, I think Ange Postacoglu really showed up Arsenal again last night and Arteta actually with his comments after the game that basically we're going to get to a point where referees' authorities continually diminish and we're going to have people, you know, away from the pitch making decisions. And and he said that's bad and he doesn't want that. Um, So I I think those comments will have aligned in with even more fans than he already had. Uh, in terms of Ange, but yeah, for, for Arsenal and Arteta, it's a repeated pattern of behaviour this now. If he's not jumping up and down on the touchline or coming out of his technical area, you know, screaming and pulling faces at referees and, and assistants, it's uh, it's just become his mantle. And uh, we've seen his team implode in both of the last two seasons, obviously last year implode for the title when the going got tough and the year before implode for a top four finish when, when Tottenham got in front of them. So for Arteta, um, we, we, how much longer can we say he's still learning on the job? He's still developing as a coach because this just carries on season after season, regardless of how high the stakes get. His behaviour, you know, continues. Uh, this year, it's happened very early in the season. Obviously, me as a Tottenham fan, I'll be hoping that it has a negative effect moving forward on Arsenal's uh, results and, and a kind of distraction and, and puts pressure on on Arsenal moving forward. But yeah, for Arteta, he needs to cut it out because it, it's making it very difficult for, for referees in this country and. Uh, you know, we're going to struggle to get good referees if it's feeling like it's such a high-pressured environment where every decision is going to be scrutinised and, you know, you don't have the final say and authority on things. Is it is there an argument, though, where it's kind of fair for fans to feel a bit disappointed? You know, the amount of lines and shown, I'm sorry, the amount of lines that were drawn post-match and the angles that were shown, Wayne, like you touched upon, fans that are at the ground that maybe don't have access to that and don't know what's going on, how much do you feel for those people that are sitting through those moments personally? Um, I think for the fans at the ground, I definitely feel for them because they're completely in the dark as to what's happening. And it's it's a horrible experience. I mean, John, you were there last night and you obviously, you know, every single controversial incident. I mean, do you feel as if you're getting the information you need no, from... No, no. It, the, the, yeah. the current system is, is an utter farce. You know, last night by minute 28, we had five VAR checks in total <laughs> where you're stood there looking up at a screen going purple waiting a few seconds for it to say decision, you know, no red card or, or penalty given or foul. You don't have a clue what's going on and you're just stood staring at some screen. Whereas people at home who haven't attended the game 
have got nine angles and they're being talked through it and you've got commentary on it. And so we need to be shown in the stadium exactly what people are seeing at home. So there's, you know, consistency across these decisions because, you know, the actual match going fans that have gone and go and support the team and spend their hard earned money to do so are basically being left at the bottom of the pile in terms of being in the know about what's happening. You don't have a clue in the stadium as to what's happening. And I, 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 I agree with um, sort of the, the Premier League saying that, you know, we, it'd be, it'd be chaos to have sort of audio clips of, you know, Stockley Park decision-making. I agree with that, but I think certainly on a televised match, the fans should get the host broadcast. And, and you know, I think John mentioned, um, you know, Sky, I think Sky was doing the match last night. And why not have the fans having access to the images that they're getting at home and also, you know, um, Gary Neville, because Gary Neville's getting the, he can see what the decision is before, you um, the Tottenham fans can see it. Why, why not get that feed? Why not get that information? I mean, I don't think it's going, it's going to cause riots. Is it any? It's not going to make any difference in terms of how fans behave. I think it's completely diminishing the match day experience. The fans are very much taken for granted anyway by um, the Premier League and by the big clubs, and it just makes it worse because it shouldn't be a situation of where you have a much better experience of what's happening if you're at home than if you're paying £1,500 for a season ticket or you're paying £150 to, to attend a Premier League match. It's bonkers, isn't it? Why, why, why should Tottenham fans be in the dark over five decisions in the first 28 minutes, whereas everyone at home knows exactly what the latest footage is? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think that wraps that segment up quite nicely. So we're going to move on to our weekly predictions, as we always do. We'll start um, with some Champions League tomorrow evening. And we're going, to, we're going to talk about Dortmund versus Newcastle, 5.45pm at the Signal Adunal Park. Now, of course, Dortmund, Dortmund beat Newcastle at St. James's Park a few weeks back. John, we'll start with you. Do you expect Eddie Howe's side to bounce back, obviously take on that win against Arsenal? Or do you think they're going to lose away in Germany? It's an interesting one. I was surprised that Dortmund actually won at Newcastle. I, I don't rate Dortmund very highly. You know, I have experience watching Tottenham play in the Champions League. We beat them four times in a row. Um, for, for me, Dortmund have lost a lot of good players over the years and um, don't seem to have had that next star coming through at the moment. So, so, so for me, despite Newcastle's injuries and suspensions at the moment, I would still expect Newcastle to go there and win. I think that was quite a shock result in the, in the, in the first match. Um, so I'm back in Newcastle to go there and, and, and do the job. Wow. Wayne, similar thoughts? Um, I don't think Dortmund's defence is going to stop Newcastle scoring. Um, they walloped when they buy by Munich on the weekend. Yeah, so I'm going for a 1-0 win to Newcastle. OK, now next up, we've got Atletico Madrid versus Celtic this evening at the Metropolitano. Now, of course, the two sides played two weeks ago and drew 2-2 at Parkhead. John, can you see the away team? Can you see Celtic picking up like a shock result or actually is it going to go Atletico's way tonight? No, I, I would be fairly certain on an Atletico win. Talking of shock results, I was amazed when I saw the scoreline of the first leg. Um, you know, I, I just I just think Atletico Madrid have got too much European know-how, now experience, and uh, they'll get the job done comfortably. Maybe a kind of 3-1 victory for, for Atletico tonight. OK. Wayne, what do you reckon? Similar similar score prediction? I think Celta will give themselves, their supporters, something to cheer about with a goal. But yeah, Atletico, Atletico 3 or 4-1, I think. Um, Simeone will be much happier than he was when he left Parkhead two weeks ago and wouldn't shake Brendan Rodgers' hand at the end. Um, so, yeah, a less good to win. OK. If we talk about the last game tonight, this evening, um, Man City versus Young Boys. Now, Wayne and Paul actually weren't that far off on the weekend. They went for 5-0, ended 6-1 against Bournemouth. Uh, John, do you think City are going to beat Young Boys tonight comfortably? Of course, they won 3-1 away there a few weeks ago. Do you, do you expect wow. a similar score at the Etihad? Yeah, I expect City will heavily rotate tonight. That you know they'll realise that, that this is a, a you know a very straightforward game. Um, so, so I think they'll bring in some other players and maybe that'll take some time to adapt. So maybe I'll go for two 0 tonight. Okay, two 0 Wayne, what do you reckon? Three 0 three nil Man City um, with a heavily rotated side. OK, moving on to Wednesday's games, we'll talk about Copenhagen versus Man United at Parken Stadium. Now, United, of course, beat Copenhagen 1-0 thanks to a Harry Maguire header a few weeks ago. John, are you expecting Eric Ten Hag's side to pick up three points away in Denmark? I'm not, no. Um, they, they were very lucky to pick up those three points at home. Obviously, it relied on a, a last-minute penalty save as well. Um, and, I, and I was quite impressed with Copenhagen on the night. So, no, I'm going to go for a Copenhagen win on this one. 1-0 uh, Copenhagen win. Wow, big big prediction. Wayne, are you backing the backing the, the Danish side or are you reckon United are going to do it? Um, one thing I'm 100% convinced about is United won't play very well. 
um, and it will, if they do um, win, it will be quite fortuitous. So I'm going to go for a draw, one all draw. Okay. I mean, huge game tomorrow as well. Arsenal versus Sevilla. Now, I mean, it's a difficult one to call. The Gunners, of course, beat Sevilla 2-1 a few weeks back. I reckon it's going to be quite cagey. Wayne, Arteta side to do the double potentially over the Spanish Giants, or do you think actually they're going to run away laughing? Um, I think Arsenal will... I mean, Arsenal did not play well against Newcastle, uh, nowhere near their level, but I think they'll be much better um, against Sevilla. And yeah, I'm going for 2-0 Arsenal to win. Okay. John, similar prediction? No, I, th I think Sevilla have got some good players. And again, lot, lots of European experience. They already played Arsenal in the Emirates Cup this year. And I believe they, they drew that fixture, uh, although it was a pre-season game. Um, for me, I'm going to go for a 1-1 draw. OK, there we go. Move on to the Europa League on Thursday. We'll start with Toulouse versus Liverpool at the Stadium de Toulouse. Now, of course, Liverpool defeated the French side 5-1 at Anfield. Wayne, do you think Jurgen Klopp's side are going to come to be, take three points or actually maybe Toulouse is going to get one over at Liverpool? Yeah, I think Liverpool will win. I think they'll um, he'll change the side a lot. Um, I wouldn't expect Salah to play, especially because he played against Bournemouth last week. Um, so, you know, there will be changes. 2-0 two two Liverpool, I'm going for. OK, John, do you reckon the same? Yeah, I'll probably go for 3-1 to Liverpool. I just think that Liverpool, albeit will make changes, they seem quite good at just getting on with the results, regardless of who's playing other clubs, such as my own Tottenham. When we make those sort of changes, we implode against European sides that could have been set up two or three days earlier. Um, we just implode when we try and do that. Other clubs seem good at managing those situations and Liverpool are, are one of them. So yeah, 3-1 win for the Reds. OK, now Ajax versus Brighton, 5.45 him at the Johan Cruyff Arena. Now, of course, Brighton beat Ajax Tino at the Amex a few weeks ago. John, do you reckon Robert Deserby's side are going to win on the road in the Netherlands? Uh, Brighton, uh, sorry, Ajax are a, a complete free fall this season. Really struggling. I don't know if they're still bottom. They were last week. Um, really, really having a tough time of it. And I expect Brighton to go there playing, you know, free-flowing football and just have too much for Ajax. So, yeah, I'm going for a Brighton win and, and it'll be a famous win for Brighton. OK. Wayne, do you reckon the same? Yeah, Brighton 2-0. I think they'll have too much for Ajax. A complete shadow of their former selves. OK, now the penultimate game to predict, we've got West Ham against Olympiacos. Now, of course, Olympiacos beat the Hammers 2-1 in Greece a few weeks ago. Wayne, do you think David Moyes' side are going are gonna to go top, stay top of the group and win? Or actually, maybe are the are the Greek side going to come and, and, and take three points in London? Yeah, I mean, West Ham are kind of, um, they're, they're very negative, um, very star, but I think they have got some some fantastic players. Um, I mean, Bowen and Paqueta, I think, would get in most of the top six sides, to be honest. Um, Moyes doesn't quite get the most out of them, but I think West Ham will have too much for Olympiacos. So I'm, I'm going for a 2-1 win to West Ham. OK, John, what do you expect? No, Olympiacos always travel really well. Loud, noisy support that they they, they got a... I think they even got a win at Arsenal in the Europa League uh, a couple of seasons ago. So, so they, they, you know, they're not afraid of coming across shores and... Uh, and doing well, they'll always have a couple of good South American sides as well, yeah, as Greek sides tend to do, good South American players. Um, I'm going to go for a 1-1 one -one draw. OK, and to wrap up the predictions, we've got Rangers versus Sparta Prague at Ibrox at 8pm. Now, these sides drew 0-0 a few weeks back when they played. What do you reckon, Wayne? Do you reckon Clement's side going to win at home again and, and, and keep on yeah, keep on doing well? Yeah, I think so. I think they've, there's a bit of momentum under the new manager. Um, results have improved, performance has improved, you know, field good factors come back a little bit. Um, the Rangers just got to the Scottish League Cup final. So, yeah, I, I'd anticipate Rangers will have too much for them. 2-0 no home win. OK, John, what do you expect? Last prediction. Yeah, I'd probably I'd back what Wayne's saying there. A 2 nil win. I think Rangers at home will have the support behind them. It's always a great evening at Ibrox on the European night. So, yeah, I'm going for Rangers comfortable win. Excellent. We'll have to write those down and we can make sure we, we take note of all the ones that did go to plan. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks to everyone who's also to watching. Really appreciate everyone watching as well. Let us know in the comments anything that you'd like to predict, any score predictions that you think were a bit off or any topics that you'd like to discuss, please let us know. Um, and we will speak to you all again very soon. Thank you, Lewis.